calling together uh, to order the mayor's neighborhood leadership cabinet meeting for July 21st. Um, the, the sign up sheet has been circulated around there, so I appreciate you signing up. Um, let's stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance and then we'll move on. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So maybe we could do some introduction. Hmm? Maybe we're doing some introduction. Yeah. Okay, next, um, in lieu of the roll call, we're going to be doing introductions. Uh, first of all, online, uh, I think Betty Hackley is there. Betty, could you say hello? Anybody else online? Okay, in the hall here. Go ahead, Chad. Chad Belichick, I'm the city planning director. Mike Vanderstein, mayor of the city of Sheboygan. Joel. Well, welcome everybody. Next item is to approve the minutes from our March 10th meeting. I'd entertain a motion to do that. To approve. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Those mo motions will stand as approved. Uh, next item for discussion is a feature presentation on street lighting, and this will be done uh, by Nancy Marin and Jeff Mars. Okay. So, neighborhood street lighting. I'm going to talk about us putting in some new lighting in our community development block grant area. And uh, if you're not familiar, the city of Sheboygan receives a community development block grant, which is from the federal government. And we're allowed to spend that money within these low to moderate income neighborhoods that they've identified. So on, you can see the dark black outline shows you which census tracts are included in that, in that low to moderate income neighborhood area. It's kind of straight down the center of our city. It's split into a north side and a south side. Um, we, one of the number one concerns that we kept hearing as staff as we went to these neighborhood meetings was darkness in certain areas of our neighborhoods. So we thought, okay, what's a way that we can understand where the darkness is and do something about it? So we partnered with the, the police department. I printed them off a bunch of neighborhood maps, and the third shift officers went around and rated the darkness of each of our neighborhood streets within this area. So their ratings came back, and we mapped it using GIS. This is from 2017 and 2018. They did the assessment in 2017 for the first time, and so where you see the darker blue is the most dark areas that they found. So it's kind of on a sliding scale. The areas that are white are the brightest areas. So after we got this assessment back and we mapped it and we understood where those dark areas are, we went out as planning staff and kind of looked at the situations in those dark areas. Sometimes the trees were blocking any street lights that were there. And that's still a problem in a lot of our neighborhoods. The trees are large. There's usually one corner light. The, the trees block the light and therefore the streets are dark. Um, so some of it was alleviated with some tree trimming. But there were definitely spots that we saw the opportunity for additional lighting fixtures. So in 2017 and 2018, we were able to partner with Alliant Energy and get about 25 <coughs> extra fixtures put in our neighborhoods on both 
the north and south sides. And an added benefit, really, of having those third shifters do this lighting assessment is they noticed about 120 light fixtures that existed but just weren't functioning properly. They weren't turning on or they were flickering. So doing that assessment really opened our eyes to, and, and those problems got fixed in a matter of a couple of weeks. So that really helped our neighborhood lighting is just having those officers be aware and looking for those poles and telling us when they aren't working. So fast forward to 2019 and 2020. We do these projects over two years because this is sort of filler work for Alliant Energy. They put these light poles in when they have time. In 2017 and 18, there was a couple of hurricanes that really disrupted their work here. But uh, in 2019 and in 2020, we're going to do it a, it a two-phased approach again. They did the assessment in 2019, and we're going to do the northern portion this spring, and then later on in the year, they'll hopefully get to the southern portion it's for a total of about 33 new lighting locations. These new lights will be put up with underground wiring, so it won't add to any more overhead wires in our neighborhoods, which is great. Um, and again, when they did this assessment, we identified areas that needed trimming, um, so that was a huge help as well. Sometimes we identify spots where we want lights and Alliant Energy says a light can't go on that spot. So we talk about what a better solution is, whether there's other underground utilities or whether a tree is in the way or there's some other reason why the lighting won't work there. We try to find new spots. This, this lighting program isn't going to fix all of our dark spots in this area. So we hope to continue to work on this in years to come. And Jeffrey will talk about something that neighbors can do and neighborhood associations can get behind that are going to help with the lighting issue even further. Thank you. So what we did was we had an officer and we've had several officers work on projects getting light added in by just having the people that live in the area add the light in. Um, Criminal activity goes down. The more light we add, the better it is. Um, people feel more comfortable at night if they're walking in a lighted area versus walking in the dark. Um, shows that that neighborhood cares for that area because they light it up, you can see what the conditions look like. Um, and it also helps partner with us as the police to show that we aren't going to tolerate any problems happening in the area. Um, so they did a geographic search. Uh, the last project done was Keeney Park. Um, 1,088 residents, 54% are homeowners, uh, 43 years old is the average age in that area. They did the surveys uh, of the 390 homes, 60 homes had a porch light on, 15%. So not a lot of people were leaving any type of light on in the area. So from 2016 to the end of 2016, they went from that dark, no lit street to just by having people turn on their other lights, adding in more lighting for the area. We have light bulbs that can be donated, but now LED lights are very inexpensive. Um, if you as a neighborhood association wanted to just go around, I would say about nine o'clock at night, go for a walk through your neighborhood, take a little map, we can get you maps. Mark the areas that you think are the darkest and then go during the daytime or early evening, talk to the neighbors who live there. And say, hey, would you be willing to leave your lights on to help prevent some of the problems in the area? Thank you. And not even just preventing problems, I think it helps. Unmuted. You're unmuted now, you can talk. <laughs> Thank you. I hate being muted. <laughs> um, but you walk your dog after dark, especially in the winter. <laughs> You trip on all the sidewalk hazards. We know our sidewalks aren't the like fanciest in the world. Um, feeling safe walking at night. It, it doesn't, it, problems don't have to exist in your neighborhood in order for lighting and additional lighting and keeping porch lights on to be appropriate. So I wouldn't want you to think my neighborhood isn't high crime. Nobody's going to care. I think there's still a lot of reasons to <coughs> encourage one another to turn porch lights on. Questions? Oh, um, yes. Yes. What if somebody would say, well, how much does it cost to leave the light on as far as is that going to increase your electrical bill? Of course it does. I think there was a study done. If you leave, you have one bulb on on your porch, 
<clears throat> I'm muted. If you have one bulb on on your porch, it costs less than two bucks to leave it on fr from the from dark to like 10 or 11 p.m. every night for a year. So it's, yeah. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much for that presentation. It's a neat program that uh, you put together and making some big impacts in our neighborhoods. Next is the uh, a discussion about our annual September get together of the neighborhood leads and I'll turn it over to uh, Chad Pelichek to bring this up for discussion. So given the times we're in with <clears throat> COVID last year, we had a first annual kind of neighborhood get together of all the neighborhood leaders at the Kiwanis Park at King Park and it was very well received and our goal was to continue it uh, every year. We're happy to have it. I guess I'm looking for thoughts on um, if people will feel safe going in September or if we should postpone it a while or what the neighborhood feel neighborhood leads feel as it relates to that. I think it was a good time for all of us to come together, especially to uh, build some relationships with the city officials and city staff, as well as the neighborhood uh, people to be able to have the opportunity to talk across lines. But um, I don't know how people would feel coming to a, uh, and we could, you know, we could look at, instead of having a communal food, we could have some type of pre-packaged food, you know, maybe like Jimmy John's or something of that nature that would be individually wrapped to get around that whole thing. But I just wanna make sure that, and I'm not, we don't necessarily need an answer now. I guess if you would, you know, talk some among yourself and your neighbors and, you know, those people on your board, if they're not here or represented, if that's, you know, something you wanna do and just let either Nancy or myself know. Otherwise, if anybody has any, you know, thoughts on it right now, we'd be happy to take them. I just don't know, given the times, if this is a good, you know, if this is something we should be planning for or should we shelve it for this year? Any comments? Well, it was in the shelter. Um, it was, uh, we did, I mean, we could do it outdoors. It would be better if it was outdoors, I, if, if the weather would hold. Um, we did we did some stuff outside, like a picture and talking and that, but the food and stuff originally happened inside in the beginning. Dean? I guess I'll, I'm just looking at it here. I mean, I thought it was a great event. It was a really, really good you know event for people to get together, get the things like that. And my heart says, yeah, we should really do this. But my head looks out at the audience and sees how many people are at this meeting right here and goes, I don't know if it's going to pay. That's, I guess, that, that's my response to it. I think, you know, the challenge, you know, you all are facing how the handle having neighborhood meetings in these new times. And, you know, is it a virtual meeting? Is it in, in you know, is it an outside meeting? Mm -hmm. Is it, you know, and some neighborhoods aren't even meeting. So, you know, I, it, I agree with you. It'd be a good thing to bring everybody together during these mm -hmm. times, but I don't know if people are, going to feel differently about a larger group meeting and you know what that looks yeah. like so I I mean we could do a a virtual meeting uh, a zoom okay. or a go-to mm -hmm. meeting and have you just log in from your house I know it's not the same but at least we could get people together to still share the information or or not I don't know September can be very different as far as weather too. You you never know what you're going to get for an outdoor meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you hold it in a place where you can have like a, a shelter and still be outdoors, people could s distance themselves. And at least if you get <coughs> light rain, you could you know be under a shelter. But. I, I guess I'd be in favor of getting together, but I don't know how many people would feel the same. I, 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 would, I would feel the same. I would get together. I mean, I had been out in the public yeah. and out to restaurants and bars and such um, <laughs> in the past weekend, so I'm fine with it. You know, you just have to be self-respectful to other people. Like we are here. I don't see a problem. I mean, if they want to enjoy the festivities, great. 
Unless if you put out like a, an opinion, send out a general email. We could do that. I would just hate to have it and order food for, you know, 50, 60 people and only 10 show up. I guess we won't. The people in the office wouldn't mind it, but uh, <laughs> it's not something we would like to do. But why don't we do that? We Nancy and I can work together on getting something sent out to the neighborhood leads and, and all everybody and see what the general opinion is, maybe a survey, no. and just see would you support it or not. And then see what that is. To make the decision off that. And then maybe you could just ask them to RSVP, and then yeah, that's what I would order. say. RSVP for. <clears throat> okay. Thanks for that input. We appreciate it. Next, we're going to go into the neighborhood roundtable discussion. Anything anybody wants to bring up? I think that we'll have Andy talk about the beat cop program a little bit first. Sure. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Andy Cunningham. I was one of the original beat cops four years ago, about four years ago now. Um, and I will be taking over the supervision of the unit, um, I guess, kind of immediately. Um, so um, there'll probably be some small changes. I know we've talked about getting back to a little bit more foot patrol, things like that. But really just making sure that we're engaging those communities. Um, and the neighborhoods and helping out the associations. Um, so um, we do have a new officer, Kevin Post, um, and he is going to be starting on um, August 3rd, will be his first day um, as the beat officer. So um, I guess the only other thing I would like to say is if there's anything that you would like to see different or anything that we could help you guys out with, um, please get a hold of me. I do have cards with me. Um, you can get a hold of me by email or by phone. Um, and um, we also have some Facebook pages that you'll be able to follow and get a hold of us that way as well. I'm pretty good at answering those types of things at all hours of the day. So uh, if you have a question or something comes up, you can get a hold of me. And you're going to be the big cop for the north side for Memorial? He will, he will be the big cop for the north side, yes. Oh, technically Memorial is not one of the big cop neighborhoods. Really? really? Because we're so well behaved. <laughs> um, so whether they change the neighborhoods or not, I guess will be determined. But we'll find out what the changes are at, at in, when August rolls around and heading start. Oh, um, I, I guess I'm thinking of the word like neighborhood liaison. Our neighborhood <coughs> officer, Bill Milani, is Matt. I think so. Yeah. So the, the beat officer position is basically an, an extra body in those neighborhoods to help out. Um, we look at different things that are going on in the neighborhoods and kind of decide which neighborhoods need the most help or where our officers can be the, the most um, supportive of the community. Um, and that's how we pick those positions. Um, so uh, we'll take a look at those again here when I start uh, next week. Um, can you say week. which ones they are today? Um, right now, you are the okay. Israel. What? Right now, your neighborhoods. Uh, Indiana Quarter, King Park, Plaza, Franklin Park, and Jeff Northside. Uh, Gateway. Uh, King Park. King Park. Uh, Park. Park. And Ann Park. And Ann Park. Of those, Kinney is the only one without an association, but they should have that fully by the end of the year. Any other questions? I really, really enjoyed the position when uh, I was in it four years ago, and I'm really excited to um, have the opportunity to lead it and and have a lot of fun doing it. So, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, does, I don't, does the new officer want to say anything? Come on, we need an acceptance speech. speech. Acceptance speech. <laughs> None of your neighborhoods are present tonight, here, anyway. so no pressure. <laughs> Uh, so I said at the beginning, uh, I'm Kevin Post. I've been with uh, the Sheboygan Police Department coming up on four years in November. Uh, it's been a blast working here so far. Uh, I did three years on second shift. I've spent the last six months on third shift. Um, trying to get uh, a little bit of stuff going with uh, Jeff before he retires and leaves us, unfortunately. Um, but 
yeah, it'll be a great opportunity, and I've enjoyed doing neighborhood stuff. I've worked very closely with Israel and uh, um, Matt Heimerl when he was beat cop on the south side because uh, I have the same neighborhood. So work directly with them, kind of have a general idea of, of the things that they're looking to do and look forward to uh, partnering with, uh, with Israel and then uh, Sergeant Cunninger and trying to see what we can do on the north side to continue things going in a positive direction. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And I'd also like to uh, extend our uh, wishes for a happy retirement to Jeff Mars. We honored him last night with a certificate and recognized his service to the, uh, the city as a police officer for the last 28 and a half years. And we were really glad that he finished his career off in, as a beat cop. He did a great job. So thank you, Jeff. Any other uh, roundtable discussion? Go ahead. I can, yeah, I can you go up there for the people that are watching on TV? Um, first of all, I would like to know if we can have like a neighborhood map as far as like, you know, where Gateway is and all Kinney Park because you rattle them off and I'm trying to figure it out in my head and I really don't. It, it'd be kind of nice to know, put a name in a map location. If we could have that for these meetings, that'd be really kind of great. So we, in the last time we did the um, neighborhood get together, Nancy put together a neighborhood resource binder. So we will make sure that we do that again. And the map was one, the map and the current assignments from the police department and a number of other resources were in there. So we will get that to you. And, and if we don't meet, we'll get it to you. Otherwise, if we do meet, we'll share that updated information. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, okay. 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 Great. Thank you. Um, the other thing is kind of going back to the neighborhood lighting situation. Um, I received an email on the 8th of July from um, a gal. She lives on the corner of 7th and Geely. And she sent me this email. She said, hello, I would like to revisit the street lights on Geely Avenue with the city again. Is this something the Neighborhood Association would be willing to help me do and potentially join forces with the association that covers the south side of Geely? We were targets of a second theft on our property in less than a year. Streets li street lights should not be determined by the average income of the neighborhood residents, but rather by the need based on pedestrian traffic and disturbances. So with that and kind of walking and knowing, you know, of what would be good ideas to come up with a lighting situation, is there something can be done as far as what besides walking through the neighborhood um, and asking the neighbors, I guess what she's looking for is a pole, you know, a street light to be placed there because it is dark in that area as you drive through at night and walk through. So I don't blame her. I agree with it should be based on disturbances and pedestrian traffic because it is right there by the hospital. So it, it will be brought up at our um, association meeting, which is going to be held on the 6th of August. So I just want to get your ideas as far as, you know, other things that can be done. So to that, I think I would say um, we don't necessarily determine the need for the streetlights on that low-income neighborhood area. It's just that we have the funds available to put them there. So it sort of comes down to the cost of the streetlights. And when we put those streetlights in, it, the cost ranges depending on what it needs from about $1,500 to like $4,500. Um, so, it, so it's really just a, it's about funding at that point. Okay. Mike Wilmis has agreed to come to your meeting on the, on the 6th. Right. He is the superintendent of facilities and streets. So he, not streets facilities and traffic. So he would be the one that would orchestrate putting in a new light for you. Um, okay. But it goes through a line energy and it would be a matter of whether the funds would be available and, and what that looks like. Um, running a, we pay for the electricity for all of the street lights. It costs us about $115 a, a year per street light. Um, so that's not a huge concern. It's, it's finding the funding to put the street light in in the first place. So what I would say is we definitely talk to Mike about that on the 6th and specifically the area that it is. It's a high pedestrian area. They've had thefts on that property. It's definitely worth the conversation. 
I would say it's also a great opportunity to do that, those conversations about light the night with the porch lighting. Unfortunately, all of our street lighting in our neighborhood is off of Cobra lights on the power poles. And the trees do a really efficient job of blocking that light. So even if a light goes in, obviously on the corner of 7th, if it goes right on the corner, that's really helpful. Hopefully, it's, a, it's an appropriate spot for a light. Um, but it, when you're talking about pedestrian scale, sometimes that really high lighting doesn't do an efficient job of lighting the ground surfaces. So those porch lights are still really important. Nancy never, Nancy didn't address this, but just so you guys are aware, so the, the 2017, 18, 19, and 20 light maps that she showed on there, by the time we're done with it, the city will have invested through federal grants about $150,000 for that. Oh, yeah, almost $200,000. Yes. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a cheap project. Yeah. Nancy, going back to the map that you showed us before, we were showing potential lights that might be going in. Mm -hmm. The, unfortunately, our... A Street is the cutoff. Yeah, there. it's, um, the cutoff is 8th. So the nearest thing would be on, <clears throat> and I'm not seeing anything even, Ninth is the closest new light <clears throat> proposed. And, and yeah, like I said before too, our new lights are some of the problem, but there are still plenty of dark areas that we haven't gotten to get to yet. So it doesn't look like anything is near 8th and, yeah, 7th and Healy. Just a quick touch base on yours. This is a great opportunity for associates. Microphone. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a good opportunity for associations too, just to tell people again to be good stewards of the city. I don't know what the theft is on her property, but uh, you know we have to remind people all the time: vehicle thefts, lock your doors, lock your house. If there's bikes out, put your bikes away. You know those type of things. I don't know her situation, but that's a good opportunity for the associations to tell their neighbors: Are you locking your stuff up? What was stolen? Different between landscaping, you know, being stolen and bikes being left out, but also then what Jeff said, get a hold of them and maybe go to their house at night and be like, yeah, you have no lights on, maybe think about turning on the lights too. So as neighbors and associations, you can educate them as well as us educating them. And the more we educate people on that, the less thefts we're going to have too. So keep that in mind as well, other than just street lighting. Because like Nancy said, sometimes they can't put up street lighting in certain areas because it's just too expensive. Sometimes they can, it's an easy fix. It, it's difficult to assess it without getting out there and looking at the streets and, and where it's at. I agree with you as far as the street lighting. Yeah, they have their bikes out. And I know people ask there and I'm like, how does Gita grow? I mean, I agree with you, but disagree because she does have personal property up there. Yeah. And that's where she lives. And if she wants to have a property Yeah, you shouldn't have to worry about that, but that's just being part of the city and being good stewards of the city and making sure we don't have those crimes of opportunity there. And that's anywhere. That's out in the county. That's that's anywhere, you know. Thank you, Jody. Any other items that you'd like to bring up? Go ahead. <clears throat> oh, Volrath North Point has continued to meet. Um, we've had two meetings. Um, May and uh, planning meeting, and we have had our annual meeting and election that we met at the shelter at Volraff Park, which seemed to work out pretty well. We have, obviously these are challenging times as far as doing projects, so uh, we are, were having a neighborhood picnic, but we have canceled that, and we still hope to have our fourth annual history walk in on October 3rd um, around the Volrath North Point neighborhood. And I want to thank um, Chad because the program that funded the, 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 the box that we have on the shack, those brochures are <clears throat> disappearing quickly and people are taking them and I'm hoping that some history gets 
shared with many people that are just walking by. So I want to thank you for the funding to do that and just to let you guys know that we're still all meeting and hoping to do some good things yet for our neighborhoods. Very good. Thank you for that report. Any other information? I'll get so. Um, Indiana Corridor, we're going to have our first uh, post-COVID meeting tomorrow night. We're going to have it at Moose Park. We're hoping for great weather so that we don't uh, have to cancel. But if we have some nice weather, we're hoping for a good turnout. Uh, we Is actually via Moose? Yeah, Moose, Moose Park. Park. Okay. Moose Park, we're going to have it there. And uh, we're going to just, we're asking everyone to bring lawn chairs, uh, masks, and uh, we'll social distance and hopefully have a good, good discussion. We've got some exciting things happening yet. Uh, we The uh, the uh, playground equipment uh, has been ordered for Moose Park. Um, so we've got that coming in. And uh, we're also going to be, uh, we, 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 uh, we are having our large item uh, pick up uh, the second weekend in September. Um, we're, we're still going ahead with that. Uh, we did postpone it. We had for the for actually the first weekend originally in May and uh, we, we postponed it to the second weekend now in September. So we'll see how that all goes. And uh, we're, 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 we're chugging along. <laughs> Great, thanks for that report, Dean. Are any of you having <clears throat> any, any challenges with getting together? From like resistance from anybody that we're not sure yet what the announcement of the IR meeting is on the sixth. Okay. Which is the first meeting we've had since March. Yeah. And it's going to be at Park Gun at Park. Um, Park is Park. Park is Park. Uh and it's the same thing, bring lawn chairs, bring your masks. And bug spray. And bug spray. I didn't think about that. <laughs> We haven't had too much trouble at Volrath Park um, as far as bugs, but um, it's difficult to get um, anyone other than the board members to come out. I mean, we haven't had much in the way of visitors or guests, or um, we haven't had any programs since um, right before everything shut down with our aldermanic forum. Um, but that was the last real event we had. So well, we given? did have our, sorry to interrupt, but we did have our disposal on the Right, that's, that's, true. True. Great. that's true. That was great success, so thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. And two full dumpsters were hauled out that day, so great. we were very grateful. A lot of the neighbors were very grateful for the opportunity to get rid of some things. And uh, speaking of Allrath Park, um, some people may have noticed that there were some no parking signs put up there on Monday and the food trucks uh, went off to different locations. I uh, did this because that morning we had a, a meeting with uh, Sheboygan County's Community Health and we learned that over that last week our uh, positive cases went up by 97. Just a huge number and you think of it uh, that one week, that was 23% of all the cases that we've had since uh, uh, March, uh, the middle of March when this whole COVID thing started. And I really felt that I needed to do something to, to try to turn this around. Now as mayor, I don't have many powers that will allow me to do something at a restaurant, do something at a bar. But in this case, uh, I do have the right to say that we can't have any parking along certain streets. And so I use that tool and, uh, and we, we had a, a meeting uh, virtually today with some of the food truck people and they've uh, agreed to do some things to make that a much safer event in the future. So they've agreed that vendor staff will incur direct uh, that incur direct contact with food prep or customers will be masked signage at each food truck should encourage others to be masked. Signage at each food truck should include uh, the Sheboygan County Promise, which is really putting these things down on paper. It's a program that Sheboygan County's public health has. And then signs, cones, or other markers uh, should be uh, put at the order lines to uh, set them up with a six feet uh, apart from each person that's, that's ordering. 
and each truck should post instructions so that how to return for pickup. So we don't want people huddling and gathering and waiting for their order to be finished. And then uh, they should all have hand sanitizer available at each truck. So I really appreciate the uh, food vendors working with me on this. And um, hopefully this event will continue to be a positive thing for our community and a safer uh, event that happens every Monday. Is there anything else on the round table? I guess I just have one quick question. How did you uh, advertise your um, dumpster pickup for, for people? Did you, did you do flyers? Did you, did you just word of mouth? How did you just um, next door just or? Okay. 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 You did next door. Okay. That's a okay. Is yours this full? Yeah. In the past, we've done door hangers. Yeah, that's what we did. That's what we did. We did door hangers last. It is. It's it's extremely and it's very difficult. It's very difficult in the best of times to get people to <laughs> to go around and do it. <laughs> Dean, so King Park had theirs, and they did door hangers last year. And looking at the numbers from DPW, they had the same amount of tonnage, really. Okay. And they just did uh, Facebook and next door. Okay. okay. So I think if we just do that, word spread from last year. If you just do Facebook and next door, okay, you'll probably get the same results. Okay. And your signage you put on the road that you guys had last time. Yeah. Okay, then we'll go on to Sheboygan Neighborhood Pride update. Has Penny Weber shared any information with any of the officers on, I don't know if she's been able to have any, any meetings during this period either. Uh, usually she'll send me something, but uh, I didn't get any emails. Um, I know she attended the Keeney Park meeting um, earlier or late in July. That's the last meeting. A lot of our meetings got canceled in July, so we're kind of waiting. I did not get any emails for uh, any updates. Okay, thank you. Mayor, so we she met, um, so she started her meetings back up. We met at Taylor Park uh, with her board members. It was more like an update of the neighborhood association, you know, up and coming association statuses um, and kind of just covering the books from the previous months since they haven't had any meetings. So it's kind of a catch up meeting, really. Um, I don't think there's anything noteworthy really from that meeting that came out of it. Okay. Besides Franklin Park and the Flats is forming. And then uh, the one on the north side that's forming as well are the two uh, things to note, I guess. Thank you very much, Israel. I, Jeff. So Jeff did Keeney Court. Did, so <clears throat> Abby's in our office, and she's been working with the group with as well. So did they approve bylaws, and what is or where are they at? So they are working on their bylaws. They did their goals and all that. Um, she has the bylaws drafted. They need to wait till their August meeting and then they're gonna push out and they already have three people willing to be officers. So I see them being an association easily by the end of the year. Okay. Very good. And then uh, again, we're planning tentatively our next meeting on September 22nd. Uh, that's possibly gonna be the, the date for our, our big get together. Uh, we'll see how the uh, information comes back with the feedback from the other members uh, that aren't here. And with that, I uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So move. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We stand adjourned. Thanks very much for making time for this tonight. Thank you.